let's take a minute to explain where mannerism comes from and why we actually move away from the Renaissance style. So when mannerism starts to creep into the artistic style in Italy in the years leading up to 1520, we see that it's a shift away from what they were doing in the Renaissance. It's very elegant and very beautiful, which makes it similar to the Renaissance in some ways. But at the same time, artists are really distorting the images. They're, they're playing with proportions, they're manipulating things and creating in the end something that's very artificial rather than something that's very believable. So why did they do this? Uh, they definitely meant for this to be sophisticated. They definitely meant for this to reflect their artistic genius. There are a couple of things that scholars usually talk about when they're trying to explain why we left Renaissance style behind and moved into the Mannerist style. The first is to just kind of look at what's going on historically. Italy, uh, in those years leading up to 1520, there's a lot of things that are changing worldviews of people. There are events that are um, contributing to a sense of uncertainty. And part of that turmoil and anxiety that's a reaction to these changes, that is reflected in the Mannerist style, which is distorted, which is anxious, which does reflect some turmoil. Another reason that's commonly cited is that these Mannerist artists are looking at what the artists did in the Renaissance and saying to themselves, we can never be as believable as Michelangelo. We can never be as ideal as Raphael. Uh, and because we cannot surpass their uh, naturalism, their idealization, their Neoplatonic types of approaches, let's just do something different. The only way that we can move beyond and make a name for ourselves in light of these huge names of the Renaissance is to move in a different direction. So these are the two main reasons that are usually given when scholars are explaining the shift away from Renaissance style into mannerism. So let's look in more detail. Why is there some turmoil and anxiety? Uh, what is affecting the worldview of European peoples at this point in time that would make them feel anxious? One of the first things is just the increasing amount of world exploration that's occurring. Now, really, this begins in the 14th century. I mean, Marco Polo is going to find the Orient in the 14th century. And we're just going to see that we have more and more world exploration taking place. They're bringing back goods. They're bringing back information into Europe. And it's making Europeans realize they are actually a very small portion of the globe, uh, that they're not this huge dominating fixture that comprises the majority of the world, but that they're a very small slice uh, of the world itself. So this makes them feel a little bit less uncertain. They, they don't really trust their uh, previous view of themselves in the world, and they're not really sure what other kind of information is going to be made available in the coming years. So this is one of the things that contributes to a sense of unease and a little bit of instability that impacts mannerism. Another thing is uh, changing the worldview, and that is the Copernican Revolution. So in the years leading up to 1520, we have Copernicus, right, who is beginning to spread this idea of heliocentrism. So the Catholic Church had long held and the worldview had long held that geocentrism, where the earth is the center of the universe, that is how we can kind of explain um, our part in the universe. But as we have increasing scientific observation, increasing even like lenses and observation tools, many scientists begin to think that the sun is most likely the center of the universe, which would be heliocentrism. Uh, and this is actually incredibly controversial. Uh, it's even into the 17th century that the uh, Inquisition underneath the Catholic Church will continue to say that heliocentrism was heretical and that it con uh, contradicted scripture. Uh, in the 17th century, for instance, Galileo, who publishes a book in favor of heliocentrism as kind of a follower of Copernicus, he's forced to recant by the Inquisition and he has to like live in house arrest. Uh, for the rest of his life, uh, about the last decade of his life until he passes away. 
So this is kind of emerging in those years that are leading up to mannerism. And it's another factor that just creates a little bit of an uncertainty in the part of people. They don't really fit into the world the way in which they thought they did before. And the world itself doesn't fit into the universe the way that they thought it did before. And so this is contributing to that sense of unease and anxiety. Another element that we have is the political instability of the time. Uh, we've talked here, we're looking at this map, and we talked about how uh, world exploration is occurring. You can see areas over here uh, in the Americas that have been um, kind of conquested and claimed for Spain. Uh, but going along with the kind of expansion, the colonial expansion, we also have a lot of religious wars, political wars, um, countries that are invading other countries there in Europe, especially Spain is involved in quite a bit of that. Um, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V is even going to sack Rome itself in 1527. So that's during the Mannerist period. The Medici are kicked out again. Um, they kind of return and they get kicked out. So politics, uh, you know, on a small scale, politics on a large scale, lots of these things are rapidly changing in the years surrounding the Mannerist movement. And this too is contributing to a sense of anxiety and unease. People aren't really sure what to think of the situation, what will come next, what is headed their way. And that um, unease and, and turmoil is reflected in the Mannerist style. But perhaps one of the most significant events that contributes to the sense of chaos during the Mannerist period is the religious change. Uh, we do have, during uh, the years leading up to Mannerism, the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Now there's a lot of things that contribute to its emergence, but the Protestant Reformation is traditionally dated as beginning in 1517 with Martin Luther, and you're seeing his image here. Martin Luther is one of the most significant leaders, although not the only leader, of the Protestant Reformation. And he was one who was crucial in leading up to these ideas that there are problems we have with the Catholic Church and that we would like to see those problems change. It's kind of the idea that's major within the Protestant Reformation. Uh, initially, many of these thinkers didn't necessarily want to separate from the Catholic Church, but by the time we get to the 1530s, Protestants have separated themselves into a new religious sect. Now, what we need to understand is that since the time of uh, you know, the ninth century underneath Charlemagne, Europe had really kind of identified itself as Catholic. That became the unifying factor throughout much of Western Europe, the kind of glue that held them all together. And when we have the split away from Catholicism of the Protestants, that becomes a really difficult issue for people to understand and to grasp. Uh, and not only does it kind of cause uh, maybe something we could call an identity crisis amongst Europeans, but we have to understand that there are a lot of political repercussions. Uh, and the Protestant Reformation sets off a time of inquisition, and no one enjoys that. And it also sets off a time of real intense uh, war. It was throughout Europe. Civil war, countries at war with other countries. We see all of these things as uh, as results of the Protestant Reformation, and they're not going to be resolved until the middle of the 17th century. So we're going to have a long period of religious war. Uh, and so we have to understand that the Protestant Reformation is a major contributing factor to that sense within mannerism that things are unpredictable, that the world that they lived in was chaotic, uh, and this sense then of chaos and change and uh, uncertainty very much translates into the Mannerist style and its sense of distortion and disquiet and contortion. So let's take a minute to talk about that second reason in a little more detail. So not only are we moving toward mannerism because it reflects the turmoil of the times, but also we're moving towards mannerism because these artists want to try and break away from the reputations of those Renaissance men uh, and try and do something 
new and something that will make their own reputations. We can't be more believable. We can't be more ideal. We can't be more ideal or, uh, sorry, graceful than those artists were in the Renaissance. So let's do something different. Let's distort the human body rather than only idealize in a very believable way. And here in Medici's tomb by Michelangelo, you can see how the bodies and their poses are attenuated and distorted. They felt like this was sophisticated. They felt like this was an elegant manner in which to portray the human form, something that was different, something that set them apart from those Renaissance artists that came before. So that is how how you know that we've moved away from Renaissance style and how we've moved into the Mannerist era.